house, it will move to the extreme boundary of the blue house property. So before the road turns, before the turn, yeah. Yes. Now, since we're talking about beautification, uh, when we closed it down, we put up these giant, oh, yeah. ugly, <laughs> orange arrows, for lack of a better whatever to call them. We'll be on revisiting Lace Day. That. We were going to revisit that all in the master under, planning under, for under that area. We're going to beautify that whole area. We Yikes. had to do something visible because people right. were having a hard time with the change and understanding because it's hard to envision. If you're used to cutting through there and you haven't read the paper or seen the, you know, there was a safety concern. No, I, so I was hoping it was a temporary concern. Yeah, I, I, you know, there's <laughs> other a aesthetic changes that we would envision, but that's part of why the landscape architect and engineer through the money that the town council capital plan just approved will help us look at all of that, what should change. Okay. And the grants come in as a funding source to help and do the actual project work that the changes so that's the distinction but I wanted to mention something on parking in case you don't know um, but that dental development practice they are going to sign a memorandum correct that their parking can be used in off hours after five for the Long Hill Green um, development and there's a sidewalk that'll go right there. So while it's not perfect, and some people do like to still park right in front of a place, and I get that, um, there should be some extra overflow parking during peak hours. So if you think of a Friday night after five, which is probably one of the busier times, you know, for the restaurants and so forth, they'll have all that extra parking right there, and it's over 20 spaces. So that's a that's a real. W those are creative ways of trying to look, we're trying to figure out how can we improve the situation as it's existing, and that's a creative way. And there's other things we're thinking about like that that can come out in that master planning, um, whether it be shared parking, some additional parcels that are in the area, those kinds of things. Um, and as, as the Marissa site starts to unfold a little more specifically, I mean, we want to make sure that we have some thinking together um, and that's why we really pushed for that extra money in terms of sidewalk connections, parking, aesthetic connection, all the other things that you would expect. So, okay. yes. Will that um, that Long Hill Green improvement grant money be used to extend? You said you're going to extend the green to the to the dental property. Mm -hmm. That that money will be used to do that as well. That's part. That's one element. And, so that there's pavement there currently. When what happens if? the grant doesn't come through? We'd have to seek other funding to improve the area. I mean, the grant is approved. We have a letter of award. They would have to, you know, through a, and this doesn't just affect Trumbull, I just want to be clear, there's other awardees, so they'd have to wipe it out retroactively. I don't see it happening, but a again, anything can happen, so we're monitoring. Yeah. Yep. They, they tend to be a little bit more cautious about things that are impacting. I, I, it's just been my, let me say this. My assessment is there's a little bit more caution around things that are tied directly to economic development. But, again, anything can happen. We're living in very interesting times, so. Okay. All right. Yes. Mm-hmm. Nothing's been filed with planning and zoning yet, but there are conversations that are bubbling up, and there's been um, a change in that situation, and that's all we can really report at this time. But we anticipate that over the next year that we will see um, some plans come forward for that area. Okay. The United Healthcare site. So recently, um, and I, I've been working with uh, Mitch and um, um, and his sister, and they got a new broker. So they they changed. You probably saw the sign has Cushman Wakefield on it, and um, Al Marin is their broker. He's very very good, and he has a huge network. So I've met with them numerous times. Rob and I together, and then me separately, and we work as a team. We've met with a number of people interested in the property that have 
some traditional ideas, some unique ideas. Um, you know, there there's definitely interest in the property. Um, we haven't heard them talk about actually subdividing the actual parcel, but different kinds of uses within the parcel have been vetted with us. Um, I would tell you that the key is, and, and you know, being candid, the family wanted, this is family owned, as you probably know, wanted a lot of money for the site originally. And the market, I think it sometimes takes time for a family to see that the market's changed, that that property as it exists, 250,000 square foot of office as it exists, is not in, if you look at market anywhere, those big, big office complexes are not easy to move. There's not that kind of tenant. People are using office space differently, even big corporations. Um, so there's still a market for office, but that's a huge campus. Now the building's beautiful. It's in excellent condition. I was in it a couple of weeks ago. Um, again, and so we've heard all kinds of different interest in the site. The good news, nothing's percolated. I would tell you if there was a deal on the, you know, that's been done. There's no deal that's been done. People are looking at it. I noticed since Cushman took on, um, I want to say beginning of Jan, first week of January, they took on a lot more people calling us, a lot more interest. That's good. What will shake out of it? I, I think we'll, we'll see this year something potentially could, could start to shake out there. So the center, um, yeah, 965 White Plains Road, which is the medical type, I call it a, like a, you know, brown and black three-story building. That has gone through planning and zoning approval for demolition and reconstruction. Um, the intent is to move CVS and Starbucks across the street and probably another potential national tenant or other tenant. There's a couple more retail fronts there. That will allow the owners of Trumbull Center to take down over time, and this is all going to take time, but take down the building where CVS and Starbucks is currently to open that space up, which is transformational in a way because you want front most businesses want frontage or some exposure it'll change the look it'll open it up peter i'm in contact with peter dinardo at least weekly um with leads for businesses and so forth right now i can't report of any new business opening there at the moment um there are there are situations happening there where a lot of the businesses that he had there so there's multiple variables and a lot of the businesses that were there are businesses that really are closing. A print shop, uh, banks are, they're going to be fewer, fewer bank branches, okay? Webster has decided to stay. Patriot Bank will not be staying. So, you know, you have banks closing everywhere. That's going to be something that you're going to see now that handheld bank, you know, mobile phone banking has just taken off. You're going to see that in every community, every town. He's had real estate offices in there by the, you know, couple, couple of, you know, uh, number of them. That model is changing. So you have a bunch of stuff happening there, including the kinds of businesses that populated that center are difficult. The space where Porcelli's was is not an attractive space as it currently is to grocers, given the amount of grocers in the area. I mean, candidly, your stop and shop here is not, breaking records. So if you're Stop and Shop, which is your primary grocery store for the center of town, I would think for most people, people like some people like to travel, others don't, I don't know, but to get their grocery. But it's not necessarily a high performing store. It's okay. So if you think of the market and you look at what's available within five miles, which is how grocers look at, you know, what's out there, it's it's a difficult it's a difficult spot for a grocer. Given add to that the lack of frontage. So if that building comes down, that may change the dynamic for that. But there are lots of things we've been looking at for there. We've sent leads there, potential tenants. They are and, and contrary to popular belief, I don't know. They are actually seeking businesses to come in there they are and and he reports to me who he's spoken to not reports but he dialogues with me about who he's spoken to 
if I speak to a restaurateur that I think is a strong restaurateur that could afford the refit there and the rent there, I will pass them over to, to th them for a conversation. Nothing's been nailed yet, so to speak, but there is activity happening. I think the fact that the plans for the trail to go through the front of the center are now um, pretty well firm and the money's all in place and that money is secure to, to make that connection. So you're gonna add pedestrian access uh, there, that'll help. If we can get the visitor center, that, that's sort of a blighted structure, get that into a positive gateway reuse, get 965 going. We're also looking at some other things to locate down there that I'm not at liberty to discuss, but to try to jumpstart some of what's happening there. I think all that will help. It'll probably get a little, a little tougher before it gets better. It's an old area. It's an old strip mall area. People want their businesses and their community differently now. They want to experience it differently. They like village. They like charming. They like different kinds of walkability and green space available connected to it. So you have an old construct there that we have to revitalize, and it's going to take time, And um, but there are efforts underway and strategies. I'm not going to, you know, I, I did put forward a request on the capital side, and I, I, I'm going to try to put it forward again next year, too, um, to see if the team has any desire to fund it. But I asked for money to do a boulevarding study and concept design for that area because we can only do so much that property is privately held. But if we help structurally change the area and reinvent it, that can go a long way to a new kind of Trumbull Center area. So that boulevarding study would have taken a look, and I have some early renderings that the state consultant did when we were looking at the trail, very just very not full drawings. And the state consultant asked me in our trail meeting last week, what happened to the boulevarding study? I said, we'll come back with it. They're going to try and refine the request for me and detail more of the costs and so forth. They think we could come in a little cheaper on the ask that might be more appealing to the finance committee or the, the town council. But that would look at that corridor and look at should we have pull-off parking? Uh, would a center island help to slow traffic in the area to make it more pedestrian friendly? How can we reconstruct the corridor? So those are things we have to talk about over time. And again, we have major things underway for a small group. And I've worked in a lot of other towns and cities. And I can tell you, you have the best people on staff in your planning um, with Rob and Frank and and Bill Maurer and all these people that are working in the permitting, our fire marshal, our building code inspector, you have one of the best, I'm, not, I'm taking no credit, I'm new here, but this group of people works together really, really well. You have good people. So they're looking um, in very detailed and different ways at how to work together to support development. So we're in a good position here. Um, but we have a lot going on this year. We have the zoning reg revision. That'll take into next year we just talked about. We have the housing choice plan, which all of you were invited. I hope you got the invitation. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, to come to a special meeting of PNZ. I think it's on the 21st. And it starts at 7. And it shouldn't be a very late meeting, um, but that's to hear the introduction of what the housing choice plan is, because we do suffer from a lack of housing choice here in town. Um, and our POCD does call for more. But to plan to, to try to get ahead of it and, and plan and take a look at what, what areas of town are, uh, you know, that have sites that might lend themselves to a little bit more housing choice versus uh, kind of following the dog, you know, the dog wagging the tail rather than the tail wagging the dog. So I hope people will participate and come hear that on the 21st. We also have um, some work we're doing to look at our municipal properties and what the future of some of those properties are. And we have the master planning for Long Hill Green. So we have a lot underway this year um, that touches on many of the problems or, or situations that you're, you've raised here today or in past meetings. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Um, thank you very much. We appreciate your time. And uh, we will move on. We are now an hour behind schedule. Um, so I have a suggestion for the board, and that is we take a five-minute break, grab our lunch, and come back and 
If the chief will indulge us and not be upset that we eat as you speak, I don't know any other way to catch up. So, we are, oh, well, lunch is not here, so come back in two minutes anyway. Okay, let's come back to order. We're going to start um, doing the animal control first, and that's on page 165. Or not. Am I? No, nope, that would be because my budget is missing page numbers after that. I go from, oh, there's two things in between. Okay, got it, got it. So 165. Now I'm, now I'm, I'm all clear. Okay, welcome and thank you for waiting. Good afternoon. Um, so I'm the animal control officer and I um, run the animal shelter here. Um, I have... Um, myself as the full-timer and three part-timers. We actually got a second kennel position last year, which I'm very grateful for. Um, we are a facility that runs seven days a week, and we have the animals to take care of, so we do have to have staffing every single day. Um, we're open to the public Monday through Saturdays, closed on Sundays. Um, so that second position actually really was a godsend because I did have some absences in my other kennel assistant, so it helps to have someone there to make sure the animals and the facilities maintained because um, usually I'm out doing calls, uh, having people come in, adopting animals, doing business there at the shelter, and, and then calls for service um, as well. So in my budget this year, um, at this point, everything through the Selectman's office was granted what we were asking for. There's not really that many changes, um, except basically we were asking in the capital improvement um, capital outlay, um, we were asking for a new vehicle. Um, my vehicle is a 2008 van, but unfortunately there's been a problem with rusting underneath. Um, not that I really necessarily want to get a new vehicle. I like the vehicle we have it set up the way you want it, but unfortunately the mechanic is saying that it's rusting and there's really no way to stop that and it will continue to rust. Um, so that's what we put in for the, um, the new vehicle this year. And then the only other thing is we upped in our maintenance um, Bless you equipment, the building um, maintenance account. And that was just for a couple things that I needed. We needed a new hand truck. I wanted to put in an eye wash, um, which because we deal with chemicals on a daily basis, that was something that we've never had one before. That's something that I thought really is a safety issue that we should have. And um, I think this, the other thing we wanted was just a rack to, to put up some of our supplies up in the kennel. So, you know, brooms and things aren't just stuck in the corner somewhere. So that was really, um, as far as the budget goes, the only things that we uh, added in for this year. Okay. Do you have any questions on the animal shelter? All right. We're good. Thank you. <laughs> He's not going to get off this easy. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, would you like to do emergency management or the general police department first? Yes, okay. Thank you. So that's page 201. So I'll have Ron Kirby, the uh, deputy chief who oversees our emergency management director, um, do most of this. He works on the budget, and it's been something he's been doing for about 13 years. Hello, everyone. Good morning afternoon um, the budget has remained relatively the same uh, from last year uh, there were a few slight changes um, we asked for a, uh, a four-hour week um, intern or college intern to be able to come in and help us uh, redo our emergency operations plan um, the state requires that every two years we, we review the plan we redo it um, and this year 
we just <coughs> completed the review of the old plan, um, and the state has requested that uh, that all the municipalities use a new template that they've designed, um, which is going to be somewhat time consuming to to get all the data from our current plan, from the old plan into the new plan. Um, my part-time deputy director only has 19.5 hours per week, and he's usually uh, stretching that very thin. So we felt this was the most appropriate way to get the new plan up and running without taking any time away from his, uh, his busy schedule. Um, the second thing was um, there was a line item for cots and bedding. That was the final phase of equipping our town with enough cots and bedding to be self-sufficient uh, when it comes to shelter operations. Uh, we had been relying heavily on a state-provided asset, which we don't necessarily have complete control over. It can be called to another community um, prior to us needing it, so we wanted to make sure that, at least in my view, I wanted to make sure Trumbull was self-sufficient when it came to not relying on that trailer. So this was the final phase for that to get more of the last things we needed to make those kits available at our shelter. Uh, the second portion of that was to obtain lighting for our response truck. Uh, the truck itself um, is sort of a mobile command post. It's replacing one of those old ambulances that we used to use. Um, it's a lot more mobile, better on fuel, uh, but it's lacking in lighting. Uh, so we wanted to get some add-on lights to that to make it um, able to light up a scene, anything that we feel the truck could be used for when it came to emergency management. Um, the only other changes to the budget were under the uh, service and maintenance contracts. Uh, there were three different items, Everbridge, which is our town alert system. It's a combination of what the state offers us and what we've tailored it into the citizen alert, uh, which some of you may have gotten from the snowstorms. It's an opt-in program that allows us to contact people that want to be notified of certain events that don't necessarily arise to the level of an emergency. Um, so it does provide a wide variety of town notices that can go out under those, under that program itself. Uh, the UASI radio system is a new high-tech radio system that's designed to link all the communities in Fairfield County, not just police or fire, but it also includes public works, health departments, um, it can combine any of these departments at any given time. Um, it's linked into the state police operating system, <coughs> and it provides us, the, the UASI program has provided us with a lot of equipment that's enhanced what we already have, and it works seamlessly with our current, current radio system. And the final piece of the puzzle was the Viochi system. Uh, that's what we use in the Emergency Operations Center, not only to, to use it as a mechanism to, to coordinate an event in the system, in the EOC itself, but it allows us virtual control of the situation so that if um, the chief, for example, needs to go home or get some rest, he can still monitor the event from his home or mo from a mobile location on a cell phone, uh, iPad, laptop, whatever he needs to, so it doesn't tether department heads necessarily to that room 24 hours a day. Um, So, yes, um, the VOG system itself does not require specific software. It's a virtual program. Uh, the state provided us three years of, of funding for it. Um, we've been looking for something instead of using the old whiteboard. Um, it was Everybody was forced to come to that room, stay in the room in order to have a situational awareness of any event that was going on. Uh, what this does is allows us to, for example, page out specialized units. As they're being paged out, it creates a, an event, and all the department heads that are listed for that particular unit being called out get notified. They get asked to come into the room, or we can invite anybody. So if it's a, a multi-town event, we can invite the town of Fairfield representatives into that room and coordinate an event without all having to be in one location. So it gets more manpower on the road, keeps people doing their jobs in their own departments, and still allows us to monitor and work in event. So it is a service contract that we picked up after the state funding ended. I have a question. I know you used a system to notify people when we have a storm, when you're going to um, ban parking and, and whatever. 
Um, once you had mentioned that you could use it in specific areas if suddenly you were having a rash of, of burglaries, um, can you use it if people, and I understand it's an entirely voluntary system. Um, I'll see an example. Yesterday there was a power outage in the area I live in. It went on, I guess, about 12 hours. But people didn't know until they came home. Um, I understand it's, I, I, when I look on the UI website, it started about 2.30. Um, individuals who did know, in some cases, one person was able to come home and start a generator. It is winter, it is freezing. Um, is there a way to notify people of that? Can you, can you narrow it down? Or does, the, does UI even tell you when an area is out? So, so from the town perspective, we know that there's a specific area out. We know approximately the number of homes that are affected, but we don't know specific homes or specific okay. addresses. Um, what that. I would suggest are those circumstances. Uh, UI offers a program where prior to a storm occurring, you can go in and sign up for your address and provide them with, say, a cell phone or an email address. And if your power goes out, they will text you and notify you, not only that the power went out, uh, but give you an estimated restoration time. Okay, and didn't know about that. And then as the power comes back on, you also get a text or an email notifying you of those things. Do they have to, do the residents have to do that each individual time, or can they just put themselves like we do in no, the town on a, a list? one time sign up. So I, every time there's a, every time, no, I'm sorry, finish. Oh, no, I was going to say, I did it for my own residence, and uh, we lost power, and I got a text saying the power was out. I wasn't home, and then half hour later, another text that the power came back on. So it, it does work, and and they know specifically which addresses are right. affected. So they have they have a better ability to dial down on, on specifics than we do. We'll just get general numbers and, and areas. But you did it once. Now you're on that list. You're on the list. Okay. So I think that people. I'm going to generalize, don't generally know that's available. We know about your system because you've communicated that many times and we've talked about it on, you know, certain websites have mentioned it. Because um, I wondered about that last evening. P you know, you get home, you're in the dark, and you have no clue. How long have I been in the dark and what's the chances of getting out of this tonight? So if you go to, uh, I'll do a little plug on the TV right now, but uh, it's www.uinet.com. Uh, if you go there, even if you, say, for example, did not want to sign up for the individual events and you still had access to it either by your phone or, or the Internet was still working, um, it does give you a map that you can go to of the entire UI region. You can pick an event that pops up, and it will also tell you the restora estimated restoration times and the, and the approximate number of people that are affected in that area. Um, so it is a useful tool, but that's also where you would sign up for it. with what you're doing. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So, so the, when the Emergency Operations Center itself w was constructed, um, they installed approximately 21 phone lines in there to allow access for every department head or utility that wished to come in and be able to get an outside line to be able to talk to their uh, different departments that they're from. Uh, there were also analog or POTS lines that we had installed. Um, in the event that our digital system had failed, we needed to be able to, A, have a fax machine coming in on a separate analog line. So we wanted some redundancy. And we also designed a uh, four-line rollover system. So if we needed people to call in, we had an ability to put a call taker system separate from the PD system in case that was compromised or overwhelmed for another situation. Um, the phone company's done their due diligence in trying to, to figure out which lines are which. So rather than pull lines and, and disrupt it, because it's all kind of intertwined within the police department system. All the digital lines, uh, we started to disconnect a few here and there, and it started to adversely affect the PD incoming phone lines. So we maintained paying for the 21 lines that are associated with the Emergency Operations Center. 
as opposed to trying to figure out exactly which ones function on a dual basis, which ones are a singular basis. But we do have the ability to run 21 phones from that, from that office area. So the 4600 is for the new voice over IP system that they're installing? No, no, it's going to leave the analog lines intact. However, it's going to, it is going to affect the other lines that are digital currently that we use our internal building lines for. So if we pick up a phone and dial nine, that's one of our internal lines. Cord it's, it functions through the brains of the police department phone system but it's available to the emergency operations center, which functions as a report room for most of the year. So, so you're okay with the cut? I mean, based on what's there, do you think that it's reasonable to cut that? Or do you, is there money needed to support what you guys are doing? That was the, uh, maybe Maria can be more specific, but that was the projected savings by switching from Frontier to the voice over IP well, system. We can take that under budget. I mean, it's, it's a, it's not yeah, and utilities, we, we typically don't budget the utilities. They're, they're right. input into the system so based on. If I can uh, clarify that, I, I did meet with a representative from a voice over IP with IT, you and, with and, and I explained the need to keep those four analog lines that we had. So they're aware that those need to remain in, in place even with the voice over IP system. And that's all you, you really want to do? Correct. Great. Thank you. Any other questions? on uh, emergency management. Okay, yeah. Thank no. you very much, I appreciate it. Thank you. All right, so <clears throat> we are on the full police budget. Thank you. Uh, page 147 is where we begin. Okay, so I don't know if you want me to go through starting at 147 or going to the uh, the goals and successes for the year. I'm, I'm not certain where you want us to start, but there's obviously a narrative section here about the police department being um, an agency that runs 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The communication center is our hub, the entire town's hub for town emergencies. Um, we have it presently staffed. 24 hours a day with one police officer and a civilian. It's not strictly police officers. There are civilians that are in there, so it's split half and half. Um, obviously, the officers respond to any type of variety of emergency or any police-related incident, any calls for services, whether it's a medical call, whether it's something that somebody has locked themselves out of their home or their car. Um, naturally, the emergencies, rapid response to these situations allow us to, in some cases, be able to de-escalate situations before they become um, may be more violent in some cases. Last year we handled just under 20,000 calls. Um, I try not to get hung up too much on the amount of calls, but what each call really entails, and we do have a breakdown of that. Um, you could have 25,000 calls, but some of them could just be very simple calls and that don't take much time of an officer to be involved in or to work on, um, and have 20,000 that involve more of our time because of the nature of whatever the call may be. There were unfortunately 22 overdose calls that we responded to in Trumbull last year. We used Narcan 15 times. Um, and you know, I hope, I'm sure we all do, we hope that that number is reduced over time. But it's something that we're, you know, police and EMS are faced with that, um, you know, those are one of those calls that are rapidly respond to. Um, and the Narcan has worked in many of the cases and we've sa saved lives. Um, in many cases throughout the year. Um, and in some unfortunate cases, we've responded to the same person's need and had to use Narcan more than once with them um, over a period of time. 
Naturally, we have a detective unit, a, de a traffic investigative unit, which I'm happy to report that we were just able to regionalize with um, five other towns in the area. And the purpose of that won't be a daily work with them, but will be um, allows us to do um, saturation possibly of areas for distracted driving needs. If there's any serious accidents or fatalities in each other's towns, we have resource that we can call from their town to work with us to um, investigate those calls, which has been done for quite some time. But it also does open the door to us to apply for more grant opportunities to buy equipment, to get um, money for overtime, for distracted driving calls, for selective enforcement. So it opens the door because the state is really pushing hard for towns to regionalize as many services as they can, and law enforcement is not uh, immune to that. So we're taking advantage of that. The chiefs and I in the area towns, we got together, we signed a memorandum of understanding of how it would work. Our town council looked at it. Um, so that's in place right now. Um, and, and one of the big things is, like I said, was grant opportunities that it opens up hopefully more grant for us just for equipment. There are certain equipment that we need when we investigate fatal accidents that do um, that survey the area for us, that do all sorts of calculations and measurements and a lot of different things that they need if you're going to do it. And if you're going to do it, you have to do it right. Um, there's there's plenty of other things that we did throughout the year that I thought were important to the town and to the community. We really tried to continue to reach out to the community in a, um, a community policing effort, which I believe starts from me all the way down through patrol. We've had a couple of what we call coffee with a cop um, situations or where you go to restaurants and you're there in a non-police matter, non-police um, official call situation, and you just kind of have coffee with the people and the families and um, it's a good way for the residents to get to see us outside of that official capacity, and it's another way for us to tie in with the community, and the youngsters really love it. Um, it's, it was a real hit. It's something that actually started in California, and it's actually kind of made its way to the East Coast, so we're not the only department that does it, but it's something we've taken advantage of. Um, we do what I call walk, uh, get out, walk, and talk at the malls, at the Marriott, at uh, Holly Lane Mall, various areas within the town where the officers are in their sector, and we ask them to get out of their cars and spend some time walking through those areas so people don't see them only when they respond or only when they're driving through, but they see them as a person and they can just stop in and talk about sometimes those quality of life things that a business owner may have to or may be concerned with that they want to talk about and maybe something we can help out and work to adjust. We do the same things at the schools, too. We do have a school resource officer full-time in the high school right now, and we have the, the two others planned for the very near future. But um, even before we had them, the same thing. The sector cars are supposed to go to the schools once or twice a day and just walk into the office for 10, 15 minutes, whatever it might be, um, at sporadic times so nobody really knows exactly when they're going, which is not necessarily for the people that work there, but for if somebody's there who might be looking to see when we go there. I don't want it to be the exact same time every day. But they just go in, and it's, it's a real it's a, it's a good comfort level that I think the employees enjoy, I think the faculty likes. Um, now we have this school resource officer in the high school since September. That's been um, very good. He teaches classes. He's gotten to know students. There have been quite a few um, situations where he's worked with the faculty, with social workers, with parents, with family, and helped children. Uh, maybe not necessarily in school the problem, but some something that might be going on at home or something that they want to involve us in. And, and it's just, as I've said before, it's just another um, trusting relationship that we hope the students have to go to it, um, and talk to us about things before something escalates and gets out of hand. It's, I think it's about 82% of all school unfortunate shootings that appear new and didn't tell anybody that, that their friend was possibly um, uh, planning to do something like that. So there's been quite a few things where we've gotten notified of and we've stepped in and nothing violent has happened. And maybe it wouldn't have happened at all. but. Um, it's something I'd rather be a little more proactive in, and we are proactive in it, than we have been in the past. So I'm happy about that. Um, I can move on to the, some of the successes and accomplishments throughout the year. The We reduced overtime to a four-year low. That was, it says, 100% complete because we did that. Um, that has a lot to do with the staff and the people that are working for me, and there we really look at the overtime as much as we can. Obviously, we have minimum manpower requirements within the working contract that – uh, to be honest with you, even if we didn't have it in there, we still have to staff the town to a, to a safe level for the officers and for the community so we can get to people and get to calls, whether it's a medical call or any other type of call, um, in a good response time. 
We initiated our first body cameras in the field. That's about hundred and that's about twenty five percent done. We're waiting to do some upgrades to additional hardware for the rest of them. Then they'll go out in the field with the with the rest of the officers. As I mentioned, the school resource officer program. Somebody's in the high school, recruiting in selections. As of December thirty first, we we're at our full staffing level of eighty one. However, and I've mentioned this before, six of those eighty one are in the police academy. They go to the police academy, then they have to have. 12 weeks of required field training before they can actually work alone and start filling holes to cover overtime for us. Um, and that it takes about a minimum of 10 months for somebody to get that done to become a certified police officer where they can then actually work by themselves. Um, we have uh, done the entire department um, with narcotics detection training for even if it's cars that they stop. The DEA came and they did a lot of training for our officers in hidden compartments and testing and all sorts of things to look at. And we continue to do that because, as I mentioned earlier, um, there's a, a major drug problem that the more we can take away from people, I think the better off we are. And it's not just about making an arrest. It's about helping people. We received, uh, I mentioned the body cameras. That was, that was initially all purchased on a grant. Um, we've outfitted the officers with more functional uniforms. Uh, I'm sure you've seen them. The intense process of obtaining state accreditation is still going on. We're about 75% complete with that. That is um, a two to a four year process, so I hope to get that moved move forward and get it started or f completed very soon. One of the things we did about communicating with the public was we opened a Facebook account. And generally anything that's happening that we think is important to the town like our our parking bans it's uh, yes it goes on a town website it goes on our website but we also put it on facebook and there's a lot of people that follow that we're just trying to communicate and push out as much information as we can semi-annual firearms training was complete in fact uh traveler's risk actually has now recommending that towns do that four times a year quarterly so we're going to have to try to work on increasing that uh, firearms usage hopefully it'll never be something that'll happen but we certainly want to be do it right when if it does happen and we want to have as much training as possible in that area and then the project lifesaver was something that we um, cr started this year it's something it's, it's a nationwide program but it helps officers track people who may become lost and unable to determine their ways back and it's something that families can sign up for us and it's for medical purposes whether it's an elderly person who might wander off and get lost or somebody who's younger who just loses their sense of direction we hired seven officers this past year, three of which were minority police officers, and we continue that process as, as much as we can. I've actually spoken with the Director of Human Resources um, in the last few months about getting another test started quickly before, because I am anticipating probably some retirements. We have 31 police officers in the department that are eligible to retire if they so choose. I don't think all 31 are going to leave at once, but I do know that there are several that are talking about it. In fact, last week we did have one officer um, resigned from the department and, and moved to New York State for uh, personal reasons. But I want to get a list running so we're constantly on top of that and we constantly have people to look at and, and um, to select. So I don't know if there were any questions with that, but I can get into the... <coughs> I have one question, Chief. Sure. Um, the uh, program, the Project Lifesaver, is there anything else available um, I'm thinking of a few things that happened this past winter where we discover elderly who no one knew about or was paying attention to and by the time you guys are called we end up with both in the hospital, one passing away. Um, is there any, uh, any type of programs or some way that we, I don't know, uh, can identify all the seniors in town and just somehow communicate and say if you want to be on this list because your other is sort of requires a family member and in, in the case I'm referring to there weren't any family yeah. members yeah. Uh, and we had it certainly half of the outcome was tragic there, there is a program out there and I can I can work probably with uh, social services department on uh, elderly that um, we can it's called are you okay and what it does is through a computer software program, it, if, the peop if people sign up for it, it calls that house every day, seven days a week. And if you answer, all you have to do is answer, and it tells us that you're okay, and we know that at that point you're good. 24 hours later, it does the same thing. If you don't answer the first time, it'll call about an hour later. And if you don't pick up the second time, then it, it actually 
sends an alert to our communications uh, dispatcher, and they dispatch a car to the house to make sure somebody's okay. And I can talk with Michelle about that from social services. Sure. Okay. So if you'd like, I, I can start with the budget and if there's anything specific. But I, I was going to talk, I did want to talk about salaries. Um, there's a $572,000 increase there, and there are multiple reasons why. Obviously, salary is controlled by the collective bargaining agreement with the union. Um, we have 16 police officers that are not senior officers that get step increases each year until they're here um, a period of time. So that's part of the increase. There was a 2.5% increase um, in their, in their um, contract this past year. The, the three school resource officers that we, that we hired from the 78 police officers to 81, they are now on payroll next year for the full year. If you recall, that was a half year budgeting for the present year that we're in. Um, we added back in the, um, the cut for attrition. And then there, are pre there is premium pay that is contractually obligated. If there's no lieutenant working in patrol, we have to pay the sergeant to the lieutenant's pay at that time. So those are some of the things that are factored into why um, we have the increase. I just want to say that in the 16 officers that in steps, there are, what we did in this last contract, uh, Mr. Hazelkamp and I we negotiated the contract with the union this last year. We increased the three steps, so it would take, if you started before this contract was signed, in three years you were top patrolman pay. We increased that to five steps. So it takes five years to get there, which I think is reasonable because it, it takes about that much time for you to be a pretty seasoned officer. Um, so it's five years, so the steps won't be as big, and it'll, it'll, it'll save us a little bit as, as we move forward with um, the salary line. The other thing we did while I'm talking about the contract is we reduced the amount of compensatory time that an officer can accumulate by one-third, and we also eliminated the fact that officers can carry, if they don't use their personal days within a calendar year, they can carry them into the next year and add them as vacation days to what they already have. That's been eliminated. 92.5% of the budget is controlled by the collective bargaining agreement. So it's not just salaries, it's it's... It's overtime that's required because of minimum manning. There's holiday pay that's required. There's longevity pay that's required. College incentive pay is required. Shift differential is required. Um, and even training. So there are a lot of things with training, post certifications that are needed. They need their emergency medical responder certifications to be, to be um, constantly updated. And every three years they have to get their uh, 60 hours of post recertification to stay as a police officer in Connecticut. So it's a big chunk of, of any police department's budget. This It's not anything new to Trumbull. It's an industry thing. And obviously, salarying people are a big expense to any organization. The overtime, I, I did look to increase that a little bit because I'm a bit concerned about retirements. And also, when we put the other two school resource officers in the schools, in the coming months, and then in, um, they will be pulled out of our existing patrol. The people who are in the academy now that will fill those positions won't be completely certified then, so we will miss people who are certified police officers for at least a few months because by the time the second, the last group of officers that we hire to fill these positions gets out of the academy and gets trained, it could be somewhere around probably August or September, so there's going to be a few months where we're going to be short people, but I don't want to hold up putting people and phasing them into the rest of the to two middle schools. One other thing I want to touch on, the, the uniform account in the present year and then the increase we asked for in the coming year um, was because if you looked at our uniform account right now, when we hire somebody, it costs about $8,000 to equip them with their uniforms, their ballistic vest, the firearm, the uh, gun belt that they wear. Everything that's required to work in patrol is around $8,000 per officer. So we, we look to increase that down. Actually, this, this year, the present year we're in right now, we're going to be short. So we're trying to hold off on that as much as we can and to see if by the end of, closer to the end of the fiscal year, if perhaps we can somehow fill those um, needs for uniforms, maybe possibly through another account if we have, if we're able to, and ask for a transfer. Um, 
I'm not sure if there's anything. I'm, I'm just kind of jumping ahead to the things that I thought might interest you. So if this question stopped me along the way. No, they because they have a badge and because they're a certified police officer, they don't they don't have to have a badge. I mean, have to have a, a pistol permit to carry. They do their badge is what covers them. Many of them do, though. Yep. So the next part I wanted to talk about um, was our maintenance and repair service contract. If you look at the bottom of that. That's on page 157 I have it on. If you, I just want to talk about some of the new things that are there because there might be things that um, you might question. The Vigilant LPR is $1,000 a year, and the LPR is a license plate reader we have in one police car. So this is the first year that we have to actually pay for that. In the past, I think it's been the past three years, we had, did get outside funding to cover the cost of that. And a license plate reader just tells the officer if, if they're driving past any car through a parking lot or on the road, whether the registration is suspended, the person driving the car or who it's registered to is wanted, if the car is stolen, if there are any other alerts, say another community puts out an alert that this vehicle is used in a burglary or some type of larceny or something like that, it will, it will alert our officers to it. It's a very wide um, network that we have with many towns throughout the state and all of their information about people who might be wanted or, or like I mentioned, some intelligence information about specific cars and things like that, it's there and it tells us. So that is $1,000 a year, but I just want to mention that it's new and I think it's the last three years has been paid for. Well, I can tell you that it is very consistently finding unregistered cars. Well, almost daily that it's out there in the field because they're just cars that are out there that are registered that we would never know about unless we actually stop the person for something. So what it, it's it's part of our mobile data terminal. So if you go buy a car and you can go buy a car at 40, 50 miles an hour and just go past it and it'll read the license plate on that car and it'll say and it'll send you alert if the if the car is unregistered or or any of the other things I talked about and then the officer can make a stop on it. No, it'll just no. It doesn't do that. It does, they would if it, if it came back unregistered, and then we stopped it, and then we would, might find out that it's a misuse of a license plate on a car. It's just yeah. I be, I think we have it set up both ways, right? It's only both. It depends on which way the cameras are yeah. mounted. Ours are mounted both. Yeah. So as you're going at it. Yeah, it does. Front, front license plates. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Accuracy is uh, ninety-five percent or better. Normally, it's near hundred percent for accuracy, and they're tuned specifically for Connecticut license plates. Did we have a problem when? I'm not sure. I say when it could be ongoing with DMV and its. Um, oh, how do I phrase this? Inaccuracies. Let's try that. Okay. And so people renew their registration, but somehow <clears throat> DMV does not have this right. proper. So what it does is if it, if it alerts an officer that somebody's car is on the registration is, is invalid, the officer will stop the car and then they'll ask the person for their license registration. They don't issue a ticket or a tow car just because of that LPR hit, if you will, saying the car's unregistered. If someone's got a valid registration with them and in their hands, they hand it to the officer, and that's it. It's, that's the end of it. We wouldn't ticket them for an unregistered car or anything like that. Is unregistered, do you have to confiscate it? We, we tow it because we, tow we, it. we don't want it to be continued on the road. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, we yeah we would we we generally I know there were some things some hiccups I guess I'm going to say with DMV with registrations and whether they were valid or not and a lot of times we get notices from DMV telling us that um, 
cars that expired, for instance, February 1st, we're, we're allowing them further time because their records management or whatever might not be up to date, and we'll know that. But if there's something like that, certainly we would call DMV and tell them, yeah. Yeah, because it, it may happen a couple of times because they go into the next town, they go into Fairfield, and it's going to do the same thing that ours just did. It's the same unit, and they collect off the same server. Yeah, it'll do out-of-state cars for stolen, for um, if there's intel information. I mean, we get things from um, all over the region about certain things or crimes that may have occurred in other states that Connecticut's notified of, and the same thing. Once it's in that server and it's, that information's there, it, it goes into what's called NCIC, and it'll, it'll read it and tell us. Right now we have it on one car, yeah. I'll be happy to budget for it if you'd like me to. <laughs> It is, yeah. Well, we, we, you know, I I think it was somewhere in the twenty five thousand dollar range, something like that, to to purchase the unit and installation and everything. I, I might be off a little bit on that. Do you recall if it was any different? It was about eighteen thousand okay. dollars, but it was funded through the project for the region. In initially, we got funding, all the 14 communities in Fairfield County got funding to buy one for each department through uh, regional uh, money, through the re through region one. So that was covered, and then it covered us. I think it was the first three years they covered the cost of ha the annual maintenance, um, which is $1,000 a year. Yeah. It, yeah, it probably is. Yep. Yeah. And I can tell you that's not always accurate because that's happened to me. So, <laughs> so anyway, moving on, <laughs> the next one, the training software, that's actually saved us some money in our um, vehicle maintenance account because the mechanic uses it. It's for vehicle repairs, and it's a software, and he's he's really good. He goes, he'll have a car that has a problem, and he really before he even thinks about sending it to like a Ford dealership to look at it he really drills down and really tries to diagnose what might be wrong with the car so he'll have certain codes and things that might read off of a computer or certain symptoms that he'll see or hear about and he this software package actually does that and it allows him to go in and, and there have been many times where he's said okay now I know what's wrong but it's because he's gotten information off of um, this program so that's actually saved us money without having to send it out to Ford, and it's actually saved us time because we've sent something to Ford instead of our internal mechanic, then the car's down for a period of whatever time it takes them to determine what's wrong with it and fix it. The next one down to Superior Canine Service, that's for recertification program for um, our two canine off dogs that are now are narcotics trained. Um, I'm actually... We're looking to do a little bit... Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped one. The next one down was the training software, tracking officer certifications. That's always, for since now, that has been done manually and through paper files. So the ongoing cost is $1,250 a year. Certification and training is like is so big for us if there's a liability claim of use of force or anything, a search and seizure. So we have to really track that and make sure it's as accurate as possible. And it also that program is also used for our recertification of our officers. Every three years, like I've mentioned before, a police officer has to be recertified. They have to get 60 hours of credit. And it's just another way for us to stamp it. And it's in there, and it's, and it's on a server, and it's protected. Um, so if we ever got audited, it's, it's right there on the computer. It's, it's pretty, pretty standard in, in policing right now. Um, I think the next, uh, what I jumped to earlier was the canine services. That's just, just keep those, those dogs continually updated, continually trained. They get monthly trained, um, and, and it keeps their certification. Now that they're narcotics trained, uh, we're continuing to train in that area as much as we can. And we've actually, we actually had some really good arrests in the field um, because we've used those dogs. They've, they've really been good. And they're used for, for looking for missing people as well and, and tracking people or if someone was lost or um, escaped from us, took off. So it's very good. The last one is the tip line. That's been paid for uh, by T-Pod for years. And uh, I believe the grant ran out for that. So now... It's $2,000 a year. It's the first time we'll be paying for it. And we have actually, in fact, just the other night, we received a tip of an underage drinking party. And we went there, and there were about 30 young people underage 
drinking in the house and parents were away and it allowed us to get to the youth before something maybe bad happened and call their parents and have them come pick them up. And then the person hosting that party actually got got arrested for hosting the party. But we get a lot of tips through that about many different things. Not just, we get tips for the parties, we get tips for other things that people might be involved in and might turn into long-term investigations for us, um, such as narcotic sales and things like that. But it's really worked out well. And, it, and it's a great source because we don't see who's sending it to us. So that's one thing I know a lot of people are concerned about is, look, if I tell you, if I call in, I don't want, or if my email's there, you'll be able to find out who it was, and I don't want these people to find out. It's not like that. We can send something back through through the company, but we still don't see who the, you know, asking more questions, but we still don't see who the sender is. They, they remain anonymous all the time. It's a tip that comes into our, uh, it comes into our dispatch center 24 hours a day. So it just goes right to dispatch, and they they send cars out to investigate. We've had calls for others, uh, like I mentioned, parties at homes, and they go there and they knock on the door. And sometimes, um, you know, we find things that are going on. So it's a good source. Yeah, the information is on our website to, to sign up for it or to go in and, and send tips. Um, that's a, um, a lot of contracts, a lot of service, uh, a yeah. steep increase. Um, why can't some of them be charged to grant some of our special agency accounts where we get grant money for being part of a task force and certainly some of the items are being used for that? Maybe particularly the canines or, I mean, any of them. Um, I'm, um, I'm not certain if what you mean by the task force, the task force officers? Well, we have some special agency accounts that we get money right. into right. from various things we are part of. Okay, yeah, yeah. So okay. why not use some of those funds? Okay. They come in for that to pay some of these because I, 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 I really need to tell you, we're about to take almost a $6 million hit from the state. Mm. These ain't all going to happen. Yeah. So, so find another funding source. Yeah. So we have, there are, I know... We do have some um, asset forfeiture, okay? But I have to be careful. That's not a consistent amount of money that comes in every year. It's not a fixed amount, okay, you're always going to get this. It's based on arrests we make and, and money mm -hmm. that's seized. Um, some of the money that's in there right now uh, has to be used f for me to buy close to 60 police officers' ballistic vests. They have to be bought. So I've been very careful. I've had discussions with Maria about this in the past where, because um, the software for our body cameras that we want to buy and some of these other things that you mentioned here, we can do that, but it's, it's a really, it's a balancing act because if the money's not there next year, it'll be another big increase. I know it'll save us this year, but I also am looking at those ballistic vests. The ballistic vests are about $795 a piece. We do have a grant that we help pay for that, but we have to encumber and pay for them before we get it. So there's a certain amount of money that's in there in that account right now. But I've been very careful about spending that because the, they have to get the vest. They have to have them. There's a shelf life for them. They have to have well, them. Well, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing and with that. Some others, I'm just yeah. saying there we have a couple of those accounts that we, we need to take a look at. And even if you have to pay for the vest out of the account right now, and then you get reimbursed. Yeah. And it's not necessarily counting something to be here every year, but. You know, forty-eight hundred dollars a year to keep two dogs trained um, is a lot of money. Um, you know, and and those are not the kinds of things we pay enough attention to when we decide well we're going to add a dog or we're going to add two dogs. And you know, there's a whole lot of yeah. unknown expenses. And I just, I mean, I have to tell you, it's it's going to be a serious serious problem. Yeah. Um. So some of the money that comes in. Uh, like I mentioned for the asset forfeiture, we're using that for the ballistic vest. We used them for uniforms last year. So we do use it, and I understand what you're saying. We do use it to save the town money. Um, obviously, that's what the money's for. It's been seized for certain reasons. It can be used for certain reasons. Um, I have had talks with Maria because there are some other special revenue accounts that Therese Keegan did identify for us. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've actually talked with Don Savo and Maria, and, I, and we've communicated about buying some of the upgrades we, some of the things we needed to do or wanted to do for the body cameras 
we didn't budget for because we're going to take out of those special revenue accounts. So that's obviously that's always on our radar. It is something we're doing already. We've already we've already done it, and we will continue to do it. Um, okay, and then I mean this is something we need to keep. There, there need to be some alternate sources or potentially looking at grants. Okay. Because um, while I cannot say what's going to happen, I can uh, tell you it ain't all going to happen. Yeah. Well, I I know, and that's even when we bought the first eighteen. 19 body cameras, we got them all through a grant. Every one of them was paid for through a grant. So we will uh, I, and we, I know we there's continue a, to do that. a national push towards that. Um, I'm not really sure how our officers feel about them. Um, and I'm not sure how I feel that we really need them in Trumbull. I mean, we're, we keep, a I, I get technology. I'm not opposed to technology. When it makes us work smarter, whether it saves us money, um, but the problem with this technology is it's not only expensive to buy, it's expensive to maintain. Well, we're doing it the cheapest way we can, and I'll tell you why. Many departments are spending and buying them, and then they're saving all of their data on the, on the cloud, which costs, depending on the size of your department, tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. We're doing it all on our private server. So there's no cost to us. There's nothing in here about cloud-based um, data storage which we have to keep for a period of time by by state law and by the model policy that came out of the police academy we we're always looking for grants we just got a distracted driving grant the dui grant that you're familiar with um that's why we collectively got together with those other departments and regionalized our traffic units because we know we'll be open to more grants that the state will give us because it's a regionalized team so we're just trying to look for those things and trying to be as innovative as we can i completely appreciate what you're saying and, and we will continue to do that as much as we can and have we ever pursued the idea of regionalizing our um, dispatch center? We have. Um, I know quite a few years ago before I was even here, there was um, a discussion, and I think there was, um, they were moving towards regionalizing with two of the area towns that are, that are near us. So um, it's something I've talked about with other police departments, other chiefs, and um, it's a big step. It's a lot of, and I, there's a lot of negotiation that has to go on because everybody's got different unions. You can't just change their working conditions. You'd have to negotiate that. And I'm not saying it's not a savings. It's certainly, uh, and, and I'm not saying I don't about. understand those points. But when the it, very expensive upgrade to the dispatch center was presented to this group, one of the primary motivating factors said, "Oh, but then we can." regionalize and we'll put in four stations even though we only need two stations but we're gonna you know be renting these out so not my idea well, it was presented to us so yeah. I'm just trying to understand yeah. where we so, are regionalizing is a good concept in many cases it does not always save money it's, <laughs> it's costly to do because the other towns have to have the same records management system as we do and I know one of them doesn't they have to have um, their radio system has to be on a certain fre the same frequency as ours. Can it be done? Yes. Is it a very um, big undertaking? Yeah, it is. And but I've actually reapproached these chiefs about it not too long ago about it. But given the state's push to try to regionalize things, it just becomes another area where potentially there are grants available to them to switch over to our system. Yeah. There, there's a lot of things also because not just us, but say we regionalize in Trumbull. Um, the other towns that might regionalize, they have to look at it from there, and they may say, okay, we may save because we don't have to have um, our records management system necessarily. Well, they will have to have the record management system, excuse me. But um, if they only have one dispatcher on their desk 24 hours a day now because they're a smaller agency than us, they're probably going to still have somebody there 24 hours a day anyway because they don't want to have a dark building. So where's the sa they're going to say, I would think in their eyes, where's the savings to, say, for instance, the town of Easton? If we're still going to have somebody here all the time because of walk-in complaints, we're not saving because that same person is doing that job now. So where do we, where do we save with that? Um, then you, if there are prisoners in certain buildings, who's going to watch the prisoners if they only have one person there? It's it just there's a lot of things involved. I understand what you're saying. I've talked about it quite a bit. I know Trumbull was, was I thought, a few years ago a little closer to most towns to doing that, and I don't know what, the, what occurred that it, it didn't happen. All right. Um, the other 
Question is, the next item you have is maintenance uh, program related. Besides a big increase, it says something in there about firing range repairs. Are we not, didn't we just bond to fix the firing range? We did. I'm trying to, um, is that 157? Yeah, bottom 157, uh, uh, count 578803. Oh, I, I think the firing range repairs, and, I, and Deputy Chief Kerb, um, Burns can probably correct me if I'm wrong here, was one of the, the, the money that we just bonded was the upgrades to the HVAC system. This repair is for, there are four lanes in there, and they're electronically done for the um, move back and forth for different scenarios and so forth. One of them's broken. And we also have to clean the lead out of there pretty much uh, annually. So there's, that's part of what has to be done. You can't let, you know, lead has to be removed from there. Is there anything else I might have missed? Yeah, that's one, one, only one of many expenses that's taken out of this account. Uh, there's a variety of maintenance uh, uh, needs that are in there. And I think that was one of the mistakes that was originally made, uh, or a misconception maybe, that the firing range, uh, the bonded project, uh, would be paid for out of the uh, project fund and not from this account. Uh, when in reality, this account covers a, uh, a wide variety of repairs for the uh, building, um, and that's why many of them are listed there. Um, in addition to that, we have the uh, new expenses for uh, warning signs, traffic signals, that uh, the work that um, Public Works does. Uh, the bills are all coming back to the police department with the expectations that we will cover these expenses now. Um, that's something that's been done in the past and is now uh, started up again. We need to ensure that we have the, the uh, money in here to cover that. But the range was a very small uh, amount of the uh, needs for this account here. Yeah, I think the big item, the big cost increase there, now that he reminded me of it, was the traffic light signalization. So if on Daniels Farm Road there's, a, um, there's flashing lights in the area of Hillcrest, somebody Hillcrest School, somebody ran off the road and hit them. They left the scene, so we have no idea who it is, so we could go and ask them to pay for it or their insurance company to pay for it, but the lights have to be fixed, so that's what, that's what this account covers is things like that. In the past, it was, I believe, taken from Public Works Department. Now it's being switched over and taken out of the police department. So we had to, we had to budget for the, that cost. Okay. Somebody had to. Maria, it doesn't, our insurance won't cover that? Okay. Thank you. Right. The, I was just told was the, amount, our the amount wasn't high enough for the deductible. Okay. No, if it's a signal that's broken, we have to hire a company to come out and do it. And we would probably do it in conjunction. No, we, we would probably do it with, with along with Public Works. Who, what vendor would be used? It's probably someone that the Public Works Department would tell us this is the vendor that repairs those and that's who we'd use. Yeah, New England single, Signal. Well, no, they, I don't, I don't know if, if Public Works would actually say this is what's wrong with it. I don't think they do that. I don't think, well, this one was hit, so it was knocked down, so it had to be replaced, basically. But I think, you know, something a little bit more minor, I don't know necessarily know the public works will come out and say, okay, this is what's wrong with it, but we don't fix it. I don't think it's like that. We have to hire a company to do it. All right. Uh, if you want to move on, I know the capital outlay, I know this was something that was brought up last year and we asked about, so I'll, I'll just address it now. The defibrillators, the uh, automated external defibrillators we use if someone goes into cardiac arrest to try to bring them back. Um, the cost on that, we tried to bring down as much as we can. I know last year we were asked, well, how come it doesn't continue to go down? Because so many people have these and there's so many on the market. And we checked with um, our EMS person on it. And he said that they, they've got to be compatible with what the hospital has. They've got to be compatible with what, because once we do a, um, we use those for someone who's in cardiac arrest, we then have to transmit that information of what was going on in their system to the hospital when they're brought to the hospital so they can look at that as well. And that's basically what I'm told as to why they need to be a certain model. But I, I think the price actually did come down a little bit from last year.
I don't know if there's anything else in there. The only other thing I'd like to mention, if there are any questions on the um, the vehicles, um, I know it's designated one canine car and two detective bureau cars. Um, the canine car right now, they got last year two new cars. So we kept one of their cars, if I'm not mistaken, and we kind of cannibalized it for other Crown Victorias that were still out there to try to save some money. Um, that and the DB cars, our plan is, depending on the mileage and the condition of those cars next year, that's when we'll really drill down and say that's actually the car. Because right now we have some cars that are in patrol with high mileage on them that I don't want to have in patrol next year. They will go to the three SROs who have cars, and their cars with even higher mileage will be traded in. So it's just to, to actually say it's um, – what I'm trying to say is we're pretty certain as to which cars they're going to be, but um, I wouldn't want to be 100% at this moment saying it's this car, this car, and this car because something could change with – there could be a major engine job to one of the cars that's needed or something like that or mileage or something happens that we don't want to put it in patrol and use it in patrol anymore because it's not safe for high-speed um, driving. It's, it seems to me, my recollection, that not all that long ago we replaced a canine vehicle and that those are, while a regular patrol car is expensive, the canines are incredibly expensive. Well, it's the same car. What we did last year, this past year, was we bought the two, we got two canine cars and they're set up just for the canines and the the one that we kept that we didn't um i guess auction off um was was basically cannibalized and used i think we actually use it for the school car now and we it's it's kind of a multifunctional thing where we'll send it to the school or if officers are going to school and they need their car they'll take that um and the canine cars that we bought not too long ago those cars will last because there's only it's only the canine people driving those cars. Now, are those Crown Vicks? Or no, are they, they're, they're SUVs. SUVs. They're okay. SUVs, yeah. The one that was remaining that they kind of took parts off of. One that was the dog a, ate? That's pretty much what I'm told, right? <laughs> we had one car the dog ate. Yeah. So we're trying to, We try to prevent that as much as we can. But um, So r right now, those cars are good. They're, they're in real good shape. Do those cars have a back seat, or is it removed for the dog? It's removed, and there's a... It's kind of like a, a panel there for them. Okay, so they you can't you can't pick yeah. someone up. It, you can't no. make an arrest in no, that vehicle. No, we don't. They have to have another car have coming. It, it's basically a platform for the dog to be on. I wasn't sure since it went to an SUV whether the space for the dog was the platform in the back, the space in the back. Oh no, no, it's right behind the officer. Yeah, because he still has, still has this, equipment. In yeah, there. he still has the same. What's that? <laughs> That's why training is so important. <laughs> Tree for the train him to agree. replace That's the car. <laughs> okay. All right. So, but what's left here says you'd asked for six. There's five. Right. What you use them for is irrelevant. It doesn't impact the cost. Right. And we're saying two continue to be funded out of the special detail account. Yes. So, if you were looking for how much each a year, I think it's ten thousand uh, per car. Yeah, it's about ten per car. Per year. Per year. God, that seems like a lot. But I guess we're paying them off in five years. Five years. And they're specially equipped, so yeah, yeah. about fifty thousand dollars a vehicle. So the okay. getting, what are they getting? Right now, they're using cars that are Crown Victorias with high mileage on because they're not necessarily used for that patrol function that we get concerned when the mileage gets so high. So then next year when, um, say we buy five cars, those will go into patrol and the ones with high mileage then will go to SROs and their cars will go. Yeah, but they don't, you know, they're, they're just... Page. Yeah, exactly. But we still want it to be a marked car because we want that presence there.
and uh, page 25 uh, identifies at least six cars that we would be looking to replace in the scheme that we uh, just want. Okay. So the vehicle itself is not that expensive. Well, it's relative. No, it's some of the equipment. We it's try the to equipment that we, we have try to, to roll around. over. We try to roll over if we can some of the equipment that if one car we're going to get rid of and the town's going to sell, we'll try to get them to strip as much equipment out of that. Like light bars will go from one car to the next for several years on. I don't, we're not buying new equipment every time we get a new car. We try to use from one car to another, and we try to really do the best we can to keep under that 50000 And if there's money left, it's left. So I think some of the equipment you don't need in a, in a detective car. You're not going to put a light bar no, on that. That's right. That's correct. Although I imagine, would you put most of the rest in there anyway? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but they have it as, they have it as two DD cars. Somewhat, I mean... Which, which well, f for it to go to the SRO. Oh, under support support vehicles. Yeah. Those are right now SRO cars. It did well before we put it in, in for SRO. It was it was probably used in patrol, so in the course of a year they probably put that kind of mileage on it, at least. And then and many of the cars that are up here in patrol are then moved down to or uh, yeah are then moved down to the detective bureau, so it they're replaced. It might be detective bureau cars we're getting rid of. They're replaced with cars that are up top, and then those cars are bought and they need they'll have be striped and they need to have lights on them and the light bar and things like that. So it's, we try to rotate the cars through the detective bureau if we can. But is it more expensive to rotate the car through the detective bureau? So you pull it off patrol, but now you have light bars you didn't need and coloring you didn't need. Matter of fact, you're going to take the light bar off and you're going to repaint it because you don't want it to be a police car. Correct? No, we we won't. It won't. It would probably be a staff car. In other words, one of the deputy chief cars would go to the detective bureau, and then his car would be replaced. But right, it won't have a light bar on it. But I'm saying, if we if you start out with the group on the top are marked patrol vehicles, yeah. which are the most expensive because we've had to get them right. whatever done to them. Right. Um, if at the end and they start to get up in mileage you choose to move them down to the SROs, it doesn't matter because right. they're going to go the same way they were. They're just going to now, the fact that they now have 100,000 miles doesn't matter because they're probably only going to put 5,000 right. on them a it's year. It's a different usage. Maybe. Right. right. Maybe. Mm -hmm. So that's not a problem. But if you move them to the detective bureau where you want to keep your higher mileage cars, you now have a fully outfitted patrol car. So at some point, does it make sense to buy patrol vehicles that are just patrol, I'm sorry, detective vehicles that are just detective that are not outfitted and painted and have them last a lot longer because they're putting so little mileage on them? Well, we can do that. One of the reasons that we need, we try to keep the cars um, for five years because we're paying them off for five years. No, I, so I, I understand that, but I'm saying you're, if you look at your average detective vehicle, you've got eight vehicles that you're putting about two, three, four thousand miles on a year. That would be uh, that would be to our advantage. I'll call to your uh, uh, to your attention under detective vehicles at the bottom of the page. Some of the last new vehicles that we purchased were the 2005 Tauruses. Mm -hmm. uh, those were uh, one of the only new vehicles that I had purchased in 05 exclusively for the detective bureau. Uh, and because they were used only for that purpose, that's the only reason that they're still in existence now and right. still being used. They had a long life for that uh, reason. 
we don't do that on a regular basis because we have such a need for the heavy use vehicles in patrol. And that's why the new cars that we're uh, uh, buying are almost exclusively going to patrol because those are the 24 hour cars with the heavy use. From there, we put them into a, a secondary um, uh, assignments like the SRO where it's gonna park, it doesn't have high demand. And from there, we would move them into the next tier as uh, maybe a detective's car where we take off the uh, equipment and it gets uh, a much less demand. But in that case, we would be able to take all the equipment that we uh, take off the car and use it for install onto a new vehicle that we bought. So we would recycle the, uh, the hardware as much as we could and whatever we could. We uh, will use it several times over. The difference now being we are still in the transition period between Crown Vicks and the utility SUVs. Uh, that's the transition that didn't allow us to uh, take all the hardware with us. Uh, pretty much because of the size of the car. What fit into a Crown Victoria, the prisoner cages, even the light bars, they don't fit from no. a Crown Vic to an SUV. Right. So we had, the price up. we had the additional expenses of all the equipment. Mm -hmm. Now, soon we'll be into the rotation where an SUV will be replacing an SUV. Everything that comes out of the old truck is going to be put right into a new truck, and the, the expense of the vehicle overall will come down it at that point. Yeah. And the other thing, one of the things... Um, if you look at the top car that's in the detective bureau with the expedition where it says there's only about 3,000 miles in the course of the year, that's the vehicle that they bought a few years ago for the crime scenes. It's, it's completely loaded with everything they would need at a crime scene, so it's, it's one vehicle specific for that. And then there's, there's, there's um, the ERT vehicle that's part of that also, but um, I just thought I'd mention that because you did mention about 3,000 miles. That car there, it's a 2014, that'll last, that's going to last a long time. Well, even if you if you look at the others in the detective bureau, you've got six thousand, yep. um, four, it, it, five. I mean, you know, it, it depends. Kind of depends where they're going with the car. Sometimes they're all over the state. Sometimes they're in New York. They could be in New Jersey, anywhere. It, it and it depending on what what cases they're working, wherever they take them. But I, I see what you're saying. That's why they've lasted in their you know two thousand seven, oh six, oh five, and oh three. That's why we've gotten so much time out of them. Questions? Yeah. Well, it says no, it's reported, reported instances, whether we catch the person or not, but that's shoplifting and larcenies. So if someone steals from your car, that's part of it. If somebody steals from this room, that's a larceny. It, it's both. We That's combined, shoplifting and larceny. So if we go to the mall because there's a shoplifting, that's part of those numbers. If we go to your home because there's a larceny, something taken, that's part of that number also. In that case, what have we been doing? I mean, 300 more essential robberies in one way or another. Well, I can tell you, Retail is a major part of it, uh, and I think it's part of its economic, and I think a big part of it is driven because of needs, uh, drug needs, absolutely, without a doubt. We have families calls saying that they've got things missing from their home, and sometimes, in many cases, they're pretty certain who it was. Um, we have identity theft. We have larcenies at the mall. We have, you know, not just the mall. I'm not picking on the mall by any means, but that there's almost 9 million people a year go to the mall. That's almost... It's, it's more than 20,000 people a day, okay? So uh, that's another, another challenge that we have is putting people at the mall and still keeping the rest of the town covered too because um, I don't want something to happen there and we need to be a presence there. So we, we work with other agencies too when we do that um, uh, through some intel and things like that that I don't want to get into here. But there's a lot of calls at, at Holly Lane, at the, at the shopping plaza and other places in town too. Well, it, even if the crime's the same, it's a bigger area for us to cover. 
um, we will have to address that during the planning process. When we're asked what will be the impact to the department, I'll, I'll try to answer that question based as best as I can. And part of it will be on what numbers does the mall think they're going to get? Are they going to go from 9 million people a year to 12? Then I'll know there's more people there that we have to protect. Um, are they going to go from whatever square footage they have now and double that? We'll have to we'll have to look at that. It's the same with any type of project that may occur in town, especially if that.